So, hi guys, uh, name is Mark. Um, it's my first time speaking in front of a very large crowd and in front of Google. Um, so, I'm basically a software engineer um, background. So, I took up the responsibility of trying to handle the infra currently in Zomata. Um, so, what I'm about to share uh, tonight is is our Kubernetes journey um, in terms of like how we came to be. So what, what I'm about to present is like how do we get up simple cluster running, um, show the capabilities. So this is more like in relation to like an actual experience because we started from zero to now with Kubernetes from zero traffic to 300 requests per hour. So at that scale. So it definitely goes to show that um, it, it can take load and it's, re it's quite reliable. So, um, so yeah, the agenda, sorry, that's it. So, okay, so let's get started. Uh, prerequisites, um, so you have knowledge on Docker, um, Google Cloud Platform, and a basic high-level understanding of the essential Kubernetes components because um, the, the terms are quite uh, technical and they're quite specific to the platform. Um, also, some of the um, CLI um, interfaces, uh, command line stuff for gcloud, Kubernetes, and Docker. So how it led to us using Kubernetes is um, we started Dockerizing our different um, projects because we were getting to a point where we were spread out pretty thinly, like each engineer was handling his own full stack. So this gave us um, speed in terms of development because we would just agree um, on Docker conventions and stuff. So each one takes their own project and virtualizes it. So the next problem we had is like, how do we orchestrate this thing? And one of our uh, colleagues, um, He's already in Australia, Jonathan. So basically, he, he started the idea of let's try this new tech. Um, it's from Google. It's Kubernetes. And from then on, we had quite um, good reliability in terms of our system. So we did some um, exploration as well, because once we had Docker, we were thinking like, oh, we can bounce around other uh, cloud providers as well, because it's uh, virtualizing. But um, with Kubernetes, we tried to um, launch like um, a cluster on other cloud providers at that time. So early on, um, it wasn't automated like now, where on cloud, you just click a button, it creates the entire uh, cluster for you. So you had to actually check out the script and then um, follow the readme and how to run it. Problems were encountered uh, for Azure, where they completely deprecated the project. So I wasn't aware of that. So I was trying to fix something that wasn't supported anymore at that time. So that was like two years ago. And in terms of uh, soft layer, um, we tried like bare metal with uh, Kubernetes. Um, we got it running, but the problem was the firewall thing and all those uh, hurdles. So we said, OK, let's stick back to GCP that time. So. To give you some background um, on like how big uh, is our cluster right now, so we're actually we have actually 32 nodes running. Um, we have eight node pools. We have 188 deployments. Uh, these are quite um, uh, the terms are quite technical, but later I'll show you like what what do these each mean and would relate to your like components and stuff. Sorry, Mark, um, I've had a question. Uh, people don't know what Zomata is or what you do. Could oh, you just give okay. Us the... um, yeah, I think I missed that part. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, uh, Zomata, we do um, hotel aggregations. Uh, we're actually a B2B company. So we actually distribute uh, hotel supplies, and we actually um, aggregate from different suppliers as well. So, yeah, it's kind of a Ouroboros thing. So, um, Okay. Is that good? All right. Uh, to continue, um, we have uh, two regions, um, Singapore and US. So right now, um, it, this gives the impression like we had um, two um, HA clusters set up, but it's actually not. It's for different projects. 
yeah, so just to let you know. And we have gone as far as having 180 plus nodes. Um, the reason for that is we were doing um, TensorFlow. So there's actually a machine learning component on GCP, but um, we couldn't uh, figure it out how to make it run. Uh, we always ended up with some problems. So we decided, OK, let's just dockerize our uh, process and segment our data and then just deploy it horizontally to Kubernetes. So yeah, in terms of scale as well, we have over 1,200 CPUs at that time. And with our production um, stuff running on the same cluster, it's pretty reliable. There was no um, slowdown in anything, so it can take a beating. So on the next thing, OK. So something good on GKE uh, Cube, so specifically on GKE platform, um, the one uh, early, Devon just presented earlier. Um, so it, number one is it lessens the amount of plumbing work. So previously, we had like independ independent instances where you had to manage everything yourself. Yeah, so that, that's a time saver in terms of development. Um, turnaround time um, for setting up new clusters is very fast in the event of a cluster failure. We have experienced actually one cluster failure. Uh, that was about a year ago. So we had around approximately 30 minutes downtime. So that was bad. But um, the ease of it is because once you, um, once you configure your stuff on Kubernetes, it's all in code. So you can just redeploy everything. So you just say, I want the um, proxy servers. OK, turn it up, turn it up, turn it up. And then we were back running again. So um, high, of, high availability and auto scaling is very easy to set up. That's one of the biggest headaches. Because in Kubernetes, it's just like one line command. Like, hey, I, I want 10 pods. I want 10 instances. I want 100 instances. You can easily do it. You don't have to worry about swapping or failing over or draining connections. It'll handle it for you. Um, and it reduces infra cost dramatically. Uh, I'll show that in a diagram later on. Yeah, to show what I mean. And deployments are a breeze. So people from our team have different projects. Uh, everything is Dockerized. So they can just keep on deploying and deploying, deploying through a command line to a single command. So they don't have to do like go into the machine, change what code or something. Yeah, so it's pretty reliable. OK, so this is the slide on how it saves your money. OK, so. This is um, a cube setup versus a non-cube setup. So usually, if you're a small to mid-sized company, you guys want to just run and go with your application development, right? So you shouldn't be trying to go to a very low level and try to figure out like what exactly is the CPU requirement for your stuff. So if you do the traditional approach, you would like estimate just just with fields like, oh, I think my application server needs this. So you have to deploy it in different uh, things, I mean, different machines. So that would end up costing you like 90 bucks, let's say, for each of the machine, costing you 30 bucks. Whereas if you do cube uh, setup, you can actually, you're aware of the machine. Let's say this is like um, a one gig uh, server, so you can actually split it up and specify uh, each uh, application, like how, how much of the pie it needs to take. And you can actually cap it. So um, in terms of figures, um, that was about last two years. We cut off our um, expenses by 60%. So yeah. so yeah, it was around, we were running like a 10K um, co monthly cost. It became like 4K after we cubed everything. So that, that actually matters. Um, <clears throat> so continuation, the good on GKE Cube is um, deployment and setup configurations are preserved as uh, YAML and JSON files. So basically, it's code. You can track who changed it. You can check it out and then just run the commands. Node pools. Um, so there's a concept in GKE called node pools. So 
earlier on, um, when Devan was demonstrating deployment of a cluster, you guys could see that it had uh, three three nodes, right? Actually, there's a there's a level of it called node pool. So it's actually uh, a logical grouping of um, nodes. So the reason for that is whenever you in uh, whenever you start using Cube, let's say you, you want your cluster to have one GB, one CPU PC per node. So let's say in the future you guys wanted to scale to have a bigger uh, application requirement. So you can actually create another node pool where you specify like those nodes in the node pool would have like maybe five CPU and five GBs of RAM. And also you get to have your private Docker image repo. So that's a big bonus. Okay. Um, some bad things we encountered with uh, GA, GKE Cube. Um, so because we're using an older version of the cluster, I, I didn't um, look through like any other uh, new developments um, to the latest version. Because as you can see, I've specified it's 1.37 to 1.57 that we're currently using. Um, there was, we couldn't capture the source IP. What that means is um, the external IP, let's say client IPs coming through. Right, um, but we we had a workaround. It works by setting up a proxy as an external machine on um, GCP, and then you just proxy it across your cluster with the right configuration of trusting the X forwarded four headers. Yeah, you can you can get the source IP. <laughs> and um, the other uh, issues we've tackled is um, there's a local OS limits. Um, I don't know whether it's capable to override it. I'm not too sure about that. Yeah. But the problem was we were trying to deploy something where it required you to have a bigger OS limits, let's say open file descriptors and things like that. So that was for like Elasticsearch and stuff. So we couldn't containerize it. And um, cross region setup is tricky uh, due to NAT uh, limitations. So what that means is as you guys hear earlier, there was like a fe term federation. So that's basically you can have multiple clusters uh, interacting with each other. So you can do high uh, cross region uh, cluster setups. So yeah, the federation, uh, that's the, I think that's the solution for it. Yeah, I haven't looked through that. Um, so also cube system namespace components are tricky to manage. Um, basically, if you spin off your own cluster, you get to have these, um, uh, what do you call this? Um, these are like a cluster uh, components that, um, that manage your uh, worker nodes. So for example, earlier, I think Devan also showed you a dashboard. So that was one of the components of the cube system. So um, the other issues we had was GKA component versions moves quite fast. And you couldn't retain, like, you want to enforce using, like, 1.35. You can't. Whenever you spin off a new one, you'll be using, like, the latest, which is, like, 1.56. And now I think it's 1.7 or 1.6. So with that all done. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief overview of like um, the basic components. Um, so understanding it, so when GKE, if you do GKE clusters, um, Google manages your cube master. So you don't have to worry about that part. So down the cube master, as what I uh, mentioned earlier, is like uh, node pools, the level of node pools. So as you can see, this node pool has like two CPU, two GB RAM. And the other one is like one CPU and one GB RAM. So actively, you can deploy multiple uh, node pools depending on your uh, software requirements, right? So node represents uh, the physical machine, actually. So when you start your cluster, if you say three worker nodes, that means, um, that means three uh, GCP instances in the cloud. And further that, um, let's go down a level. Um, so we're looking at the node level now. So node levels uh, contain uh, deployments. So um, 
it, it doesn't necessarily reside on the node. Um, sorry for the wrong diagram. I mean, yeah, there, that, that's some disconnect there. But actually, this is just a concept where what's next to a node? So it's called deployments. So deployments are your different applications. For example, they're uh, enclosed in parentheses. So this is your web application. You have another deployment for your caching server. You have another one for the proxy servers. So let's go down to the deployment level. So deployment level uh, consists of replica sets. So what are replica sets? They are there to control, um, to have a version control on your deployments. So whenever you deploy, it'll, it'll preserve a replica set. And then whenever you do another deploy, another replica set. So for example, here on this diagram, um, we're on currently release uh, 200 with the pods running. So the, the good thing about GKE is it's a breeze to do rollbacks. You can say, hey, I want the previous version because this version is breaking. So you just issue one command, and it'll, it'll reallocate the replica sets too, and then it'll just wipe out all the other pods there. So that's the nice thing. And you're guaranteed to have um, no code volatility in terms of things like that, because it just gets another uh, Docker version and deploy it. So everything is fixed to your image. So the next level, which is the pod. The pod is like the last thing which you can scale. So every single pod, um, it contains uh, multiple containers. Right? So I would recommend um, you guys having only one container per pod, because unless you want to really understand like how does Kubernetes understand uh, whether the entire pod is failing or not. Because once you have multiple um, containers, you'll have like a three out of three on your pod. So it's like two out of three. Yeah, it's, it's something that I'm not, I do not know of. But yeah, to simplify things, I would suggest your deployment to have uh, one container per pod. Um, OK, so the next thing is, how does your uh, request go through your pods right? after you've deployed your stuff there? So how requests go through is through a component called a service. So what a service is, is it'll try to create routing uh, path that goes to your pod. All right? So you create a service. The service will automatically create an endpoint depending on your configuration on your service. So it can actually point to the pods from the replica set earlier. So anytime you want to do a rollback, you don't have to tinker with these stuff. You just say you want to roll back to the previous replica set, and all the routing will be handled. So that, that, that's why it provides a lot of convenience. So all right, um, to start off, um, I'm on the path to going to the demo. So these are actually fixed images um, of the container engine creation. So as what Devon uh, earlier demoed. Um, so you go to G GKE, uh, you can actually um, create the clusters. So um, one thing to note is the option to turn off or turn on the G GCP services of logging your cluster and uh, stack monitoring. Um, I'll go. I'll um, explain that further on the, down, the, down the slides. Um, also, the, um, one suggestion is when you're initially creating your cluster, I would suggest like cranking um, all the requirements down. The reason is whenever you create a cluster on GKE, it defaults to a node pool named default uh, pool. I don't think you would want to use a default pool on your project. I mean, as a, as a read readability thing, like you want to name it more meaningfully. So crank it down. And <clears throat> so to go, go further, you, this, this should be your um, cluster after you've created it. So it's here that you can see like, oh, this is your cluster detail. And this is the initial uh, node pool I was mentioning. So as you can see, there's a, it's a very fine text, but it actually displays this node pool is named as a default pool. Yeah, so 
as such, um, try to uh, scale it down to zero, then you create another node pool for like, let's say your caching servers or your application servers. Yeah. Um, so I'm about to show you the stuff it created. Um, for example, um, sorry, let me just transition here. Okay, so if you go to, um, okay, all right. So container engine. So if you go to container clusters, so from the slide, um, wait for it. So actually, we created a um, cluster here called Zomata Demo. So this is assuming that I've already um, scaled down the default pool. So as you can see down here, I don't know if it's a, uh, can I zoom in? Oh yeah, all right. So I can, as you can see down here, I've um, reduced the size of the pool to zero. Then I've got to see, sorry, it's, here. it's right here. So I've created another node pool. Um, let's say this is called the text processing. So this is what I've been mentioning. So at least it gives uh, meaning to what you're doing. What is a node pool? Sorry? What exactly is a node pool? So node pool is uh, a logical grouping of your nodes. Yeah. It's a tagging. Do you take some VMs and tag them on the same database? Um, you don't need to tag it. Um, so it's just a grouping so that the, the purpose of node pools is to have a heterogeneous mix of machines on your cluster. Because, sorry? Homogeneous. I think it's heterogeneous, right? Because it's, okay. Inside the pool, they're homogeneous. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. The inside the pool, they're homogeneous. So. But just to clarify, is this, this is not a Kubernetes concept. This is specific to Google GKE, right? A node pool. A node pool? Um, yeah. Okay, I so. think so. I think so. Sorry. So I'm not too sure as well on that. But as a user, I've been using GKE, and yeah, this was a concept on it. Yeah. But All right, um, so to continue. Um, so um, one of the pitfalls is the Docker image prep. So um, the importance of the entry point keyword, um, you don't wanna keep on using CMDs and non-exec form of starting up your um, image. The reason for that is the kill signal for, um, let's say you want to terminate your pods on the cluster. It actually sends a SIG term specifically to uh, the process ID one. So I can show you down the next slide is, so if you can see, um, this is a demo, um, the exec form of um, entry point, this is how you, you have to do it, uh, it's an array of string. So what happens is, when you spin off your container, your process will be on um, process ID one. So it's a, it's a dumb application where it just tails a text file. So as compared to the shell form, what happens here is that when you start your container, it'll be wrapped through a shell command. So the problem here is when the Docker tries to kill your pod, it sends a sig term to PID one. If it hits the shell wrapped process, and if there's nothing handling that signal, nothing goes through your app. No signal will be delivered to your app. Because that, that's one of the pitfalls we had were early days where we just deploy things and we were like, why isn't it dying when um, Kubernetes was shutting it off? That's one thing. And um, yeah, so I'm about to give you a live walkthrough in terms of like um, deploying, scaling, sorry, go for it. Okay, you just said you had this problem. How did you solve it? Oh, the, you mean the entry point thing, right? So I yeah. just had to revisit all the Docker files and fix okay, it. Okay, so you're using like some, some kind of init within the Docker now. Sorry? Come what on. are you doing now? Are you, doing, are you using some kind of init system within the Docker? Uh, no, no. So, so the, 
the Docker files, so I just had to replace them, like re-review all of them and look at it, whether they're using a non, non um, exec form, and I, I just replaced it with exec form. Okay. Yeah. And okay, uh, live rock through on the capabilities. Um, so earlier we just um, spin up a um, cluster. So as you can see on the, sorry, let me just zoom it in further. Okay. So as you can see, the cluster size of this is one. So worker node one. What that means is in your Google Cloud, you can see that there is a, oops, see, this is too big now. Okay. So this is on the VM instance panel now. So you can see it actually creates a, uh, a GCP instance. So this is your, um, your node. This is a single node. So if you want to scale and require more resources, you can actually um, come back here to the node pool. It actually creates an instance group on GKE. So you can actually just quickly take a look, like, oh, what's it doing from all the instance groups? So if you want to scale, um, you, can, you can turn on the auto scale you want. Um, so you can specify like CPU metrics. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, for now, let's simplify things and not do an auto scale. For example, I want to scale it to uh, three machines now. So voila, it's just doing that. Then it'll create three instances. Now you have uh, three machines. So that's how fast it can scale. Because right now we're, we're just running with our clients, so any clients that comes on board, we can just scale horizontally. Yeah, we, we don't have to um, beat our heads on trying to figure out how to do that. So basically, so these VMs running as wrong. Yes, so the VMs initially you show is running from Kubernetes clusters, right? The, uh, sorry? And now basically you're in the VM instance and you scale basically Kubernetes clusters from the VM instance side. I uh, know, so, so earlier, um, so, so to, to get back to that, um, it's, uh, so there's a GKE thing um, here. So you can see container clusters, right? So container clusters would have the node pools, right? So, so the node pools from here it belonged to a um, text processing uh, node, as you can see here. Right. So actually, what what's going on is it's actually a node pool would be an instance group in GCP. That's how they manage the stuff. So when you do the uh, scaling from there, you can just go to the instance group and adjust how many instances you want. There you go. So. It is, does that, sorry, answer question or? <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so that's how you scale in terms of physical machines. So we have actually done like 180 instances and it's pretty reliable. And to, to show you on the command line, um, so for example, um, so you just have to get familiar with the command line as well. So there's something like a command called, sorry, I need to zoom this in. Yeah, that should. So there's something called, uh, oops. There's a command called get nodes. So what that means is it lists down the nodes for your cluster. So now we're anticipating three. It takes a, a while to sync up the other three. So at, right now you can see it's still uh, one, of the, one of the nodes. Um, yeah, it takes a while. Um, <coughs> Sorry, should be the same project, uh, but it takes a while. Um, for what? Ninety-two. Cloud Shell. Sorry? <laughs> oh, Cloud Shell. I've never used the Cloud Shell. Yeah, right. This little, uh... Oh, this one? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Um, it's, there's actually an indicator where it's still spinning. Um, that means the, it's still in progress. So as you can see, there's a tooltip saying that it's resizing from one to three. Um, right, come on now. All right, there you go. So as you can see, yeah. Um, so what this means is there are further commands to like inspect your nodes. Uh, that's one of the nice things where you can see like what's what's a node that you created. So there's something called the describe, and you can actually see this stuff. So actually, that um, it displays a lot of information. Um, for example, um, what are the current things deployed, as you can see, in the machine. Um, it actually provides you like, oh, this uh, machine has one CPU and 6.5 gig of mem. How many pods can it take, right? So, yeah. And you have your um, memory and um, CPU limit stats here as well. So you can see as early on, earlier slides, the pi thing, where you can divide your pods and application inside here. So now to demonstrate um, some of the um, configurations, um, you can see, um, so there's, there's a couple of different components here. I don't know if it's clear enough. But so as you can see, there, there's a lot of YAML files. So <clears throat> to start off, um, let me just jump directly into an application. Um, let's say this, um, this thing called a simple app. Um, so this is actually a deployment configuration. You don't have to try to understand like each of the lines, but yeah, this is actually like a full-fledged uh, deployment configuration yeah, for controlling your stuff. So um, you have uh, certain configurations like um, the resource control. I don't think this is quite small, but here you can actually specify like how much of CPU you want to take from the Pi like uh, the memory and stuff. And you can actually cap it, you can limit it so that it doesn't go through. So you have five applications deployed on a, um, on an, on a node. So if you limit it to just like 200 um, M CPU, it doesn't go over and like hog the machine or clog the machines. So to deploy that, um, I can show you something. Um, so, example, let me get my deployments. So there's a command called, oh, sorry. So, let me delete my deployments. So currently I'm gonna remove a deployment for now. To show you guys. And as a proxy, are you using, are you building your own container and Genix proxy or use Kubernetes proxy? Um, it's a combination of both because um, you need a um, external load balancer from GCP to connect outside traffic and it'll go through your uh, Nginx proxy. And from there it handles all the routing inside your cluster. So, me delete a deployment now. I'm oh, sorry. So to deploy the application, uh, we just need to do a uh, create command and say the file being on. So you just need to do a. Um, command line where you just point it to your configuration. So for example, it was on the deploy, um, sorry, this is the cube. So for example, here, simple app. So, so the app actually just returns a host name so as you can see, it creates it. So if we examine um, how many pods now are running, 
So as you can see, it is creating the uh, application that you just did. So it takes um, very quick. Um, it's, a, it's a very easy way to deploy your stuff. So after it's ready, um, just have to wait a little bit. Because it'll do uh, liveness checks and stuff. So all right, um, it's running now. It's not ready. Oh, there's a watch thing. All right. It is running now. So it only have an endpoint for it. So what it does is it just prints a um, it just prints the host name for it. So host name being the um, pod name itself. So as you can see, it should be like six four four um, one R Z seven. Okay. Oh, sorry. It needs to be hostname. Sorry about that. There you go. So it's actually hitting the servers. Um, let me zoom that in. There we go. So it's actually hitting the server itself. Um, so what that means is that um, your stuff can be horizontally scaled very quickly. Um, so as you can see right now, it's a single. Um, oops, sorry. Let me do that again. So it's a single um, pod. So let's say your traffic increases. You can actually do commands like just scale. And then you can say, I want um, it to be three instances. And you can specify the deployment. So these are uh, command lines um, that are available to the cube control. So this is how, how easy it is to quickly scale. So once it's scaled, if you do a get PO, so as you can see, there's like three pods coming up now. So it's actually very easy to, to take on traffic. And um, the nice thing about it is the other thing I want to show you is there's actually a, a component called a horizontal pod autoscaler. So what this is is this component manages your auto-scaling capabilities of your pods. So you can actually um, target it to a deployment. So for example, um, so currently this configuration shows that it's for the Nginx proxy. So you can actually specify like what's your minimum and maximum replica. So you can specify like initially I want to have uh, two proxies. And you can say I want to have um, five proxies to scale up to when it starts to face um, like 60% CPU load. But the, the question is, so what we are scaling, basically, the number of the, well, number of the pods in, across the clusters, the, the VMs that it's attached to the, to the cluster, right? Uh, yep. So if you breach that limit, let's say entire cluster running almost at full capacity, is it any way to scale or to add additional capacity from the VM? From the load? The cluster? From the node side. Uh, yeah, so there was earlier um, on GKE, there was, a, um, there was an auto scaling capability. So. Yeah, but they had a warning not to use it in Google Container Engine. Oh, they had a warning? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can use auto scaling in Google Container Engine. Um, so when I've used this before, I haven't scaled it from this side. Um, you can scale it back in the, in the container. UI, there's a way of increasing um, the nodes, and that's supported. Um, I haven't ever seen anyone actually do this, go into the into the um, compute side and scale the compute. Okay. I've actually only ever done it from the GKE platform, and then it's... Yeah, but there's no automatic. No, it is. So, so it's, but it's beta. Ah, it's beta, yeah. okay. It is supported from the GKE plat uh, UI, and it's in beta. Okay. So you can add compute. Yeah, it could be related to when you when you launch your cluster for the yeah. first time you set it up, but over time if you want to modify, yeah, you go to the master and you do it okay. from that dashboard. I have another question because the extra layer of the pool, right? Yeah. So you may be reaching the the capacity of a pool 
will will this scaling spill over to other pools that may be in the same cluster, or are they limited to a pool? So the auto scaling configuration for the G Cloud is uh, it's per pool configuration because a pool would be translated no, to no, an no, instance. No, group. I'm not talking about uh, the auto scaling of the cluster itself, but okay. from Kubernetes. Okay, so you're talking. You are, you are scaling the number of pods. Okay. Are those number of pods going to be limited to a pool, or will they just go where? Um, so actually, you can specify. You can configure it to only reside to certain pools, or you okay. can yeah specify it to go across node pools or all the all the pools. So actually, it intelligently distributes your application. For example, you have five machines. So when you scale to like seven, eight, or ten instances, it actually distributes them evenly. Yeah, but. You are scaling a single pool, right? Ah, uh, sorry. Come again. Uh, when we use scale the, you scale a pool. You don't scale the whole cluster. That's what I understood. You have. Now, if you're doing scaling on the pool level, you're controlling the physical machine. Yes, scaling, yes, yes. Right. So if you're on the pod, you're on the cluster level where you can see both the node pools. Right? So if you don't configure your pods to deploy to certain node pools, they can okay. actually reside in both of the node pools. Mm -hmm. So um, going back. Um, oops, sorry about that. So on, on the scaling for Nginx, um, so I have one already um, registered here as get HPA. So then I guess you can see. Oopsie, that brings it down. Sorry. So let me bring it all the way up. So as you can see, this is a um, HPA resource. So it actually displays your, um, this is like the target CPU and uh, your current usage. Uh, the table is misaligned, so sorry on the on the tab thing here. It's because of the reason. So currently and minimum pods and max pods, right? Sorry. So this is currently um, having like the configuration of two is the two. So actually I can update that with just a single command as well. Um, so, sorry. So for example, I'll apply the file earlier. Um, sorry. It's a lot of prefix. Um, And then cube, then we go HPA. So there's a config called apply, and it'll just easily apply whatever you have updated to your configuration. So it'll say it has been configured. So if you check your HPA again, so as you can see, the configurations are reflected. And this is, um, last time what I've read, I don't know what's the current updated um, functionality is. This is actually a uh, real-time CPU usage across all your pods. So it actually updates every three minutes. So that's something to take note because we use the HPA information as something like an alert for us as well. Um, yeah, with that, I guess, um, also, sorry. Um, the other thing is, so there is a lot of capability on um, GKE where um, you can configure all your uh, ENV variables here as well. So for the things to deploy, so that's uh, with relation to, um, sorry, what was the ENV bar? ENV var, okay, I don't have it here. So you can actually configure ENV var uh, to your deployments. And the other thing is you have to specify and configure uh, the liveliness and readiness probe. So these things will make sure that it'll properly detect and properly do routing and failovers. So what these things does is you can configure it to hit an endpoint of your application, try to connect to a socket to see if your pod is alive. So 
try to always remember to configure a liveliness and a readiness. Readiness means that it'll route it when it's ready, and a liveliness will restart it if it's not responding. So it gives you a hassle-free worry. <laughs> and also the other thing to um, consider is, um, so in terms of the service as what I talked to you about, it's the thing that routes um, the components in. Actually, you can actually route services to external instances as well. That's actually possible for, let's say you have a per, uh, databases, right, where you don't want them to reside inside your cluster. So you can actually configure, um, these are called endpoints components. Um, I can show you a couple. So let's say if you do a get service, what you get is something like this. Uh, what this means is, what this line means is, this is the external IP for hitting the Nginx, so we can try it. Uh, I think I've configured it to give us a forbidden. Or not found. All right. So <clears throat> these have, um, it's saying that this has a port of 80 open and 443 and routes to um, these respective ports in your cluster. So further down, there were something called endpoints, as I mentioned. So from this component, you can see like, oh, your engine X actually um, has these endpoints. So these represents the different instances in your cluster. Right? So whenever you do uh, deploy, scale, everything, all of these are handled. So you don't have to worry about it. And yeah, that is basically it. Sorry. All right. Do we have any questions from all? Thank you. It's a good presentation. Uh, just now you shared there are some uh, problem you are experiencing while using the Kubernetes. But I just want to also learn from you that. Uh, usually while deploying the cluster for some on-premises uh, cloud setup, another issue we'll be facing will be related to, uh, for some very high uh, I.O. intensive uh, application. Mm -hmm. Because right now, because of this uh, cloud setup, it's easy to do scale up to add more CPU and add more RAM, mm -hmm. especially with this kind of uh, cluster setup. Mm -hmm. So how do you, have you experienced any uh, performance issues when certain application requires uh, additional uh, IOPS, meaning high disk I/O. Because I see the configuration that you can add additional SSD disk, but mm. uh, have you experienced any slow uh, I/O performance issue? Uh, yeah, actually, we have experienced it before. So when we were doing the TensorFlow thing for the cluster. So we were actually doing an NFS um, server. So we basically mounted to our cluster so that we were doing NFS IO. And when it cluttered up the bandwidth, it started to not respond. Yeah, so, so your stuff will start to get killed. Okay, so that, for that issue mm -hmm. that by adding additional SSD disk uh, into the configuration, Will that help? Or actually, it can only add up to a certain number of SSD, and that also limits to IOPS. Um, the additional, I haven't tinkered with the additional uh, SSD feature, but okay. if, if you do like um, disk mounting, so actual like volume in, in your pod, I think that would be, that would solve the issue because how we solved the problem with that is we had to. Um, separate the data, and then we just pull it down to the local file system and run it. Yeah, so we, we basically split it into smaller bits. Okay, thanks a lot, thank you. So we're handing out stickers for two more questions. Yeah, just out of curiosity, I want to know what Docker runtime is already installed in the node when you create, uh, like Google create the nodes. Uh, Docker runtime. The Docker runtime? The yeah. 
when it has to be there in the node, right? Um, uh, yeah, so um, when you when you use um, Docker with uh, the gcloud, the gcloud uh, CLI actually wraps a Docker functionality. So but do we the, have to install it separately on the node? No, no. It's I think it's configurable, but for example, um, as you can see here, gcloud um, can't remember the command lines here, but it actually displays I think was it version. I think in one case, I think it was 111 something. I saw the. Or something like, yeah, I can't remember all the parameters. Some way it doesn't oh, yeah, there you go. So, as you can see, it's like 1.12. Yeah. So, can we upgrade it separately? Or um, can yeah, we can. We can. We've tried it before. But as long as, if it works, try not to do so. Because last time we encountered an issue where everyone couldn't push because um, it had something to do with um, it working coincidentally with gcloud. Yeah, that similar situation that yeah. I had. And you have to roll back. We tried that before. We tried to look into solutions, and then yeah, it just causes more pain and trouble. Yeah. Basically, what issue that I faced, the kubelet doesn't communicate with the Docker and time. Man. Yes, we've encountered that issue as well. So as long as this work, don't move it. I mean, you can upgrade because uh, GKE would start to inform you, like, oh, your node pool is pretty old. You better start switching, and that's the time you start to switch. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> questions for Hunter. Sure. <laughs> About the stateful apps and the storage volume side. Yes. Uh, when when all this started, right? It was all about cloud native apps, stateless apps, keeping your services separate from applications and all. Then what is the driving factor to have stateful apps again running in container? What what, what is the driving factor? Why do we talk about this? Why do we want to do stateful apps? Why do I think because the workload still exists. Um, you still need to run a database at some point. Um, you still need to be able to store your data in WordPress or, you know, if you're running Hadoop and you can just go to GPE or any of those sorts of things. Those things need to be stored somewhere and you need to be able to have them existing when the node fails or you know, just when you're scaling. So that's, that's why it's data workloads to exist. Right. So what happens is most of the times database is not a small database. It's, it grows with time and it, you know, with the data and all that. She was just explaining the I.O. problems and all kind of problems will come. So database is something that you have to care for. You know, you have yes. to temper it. If that is the requirement, why do you have to run it inside a container? Um, well, as I said, if you can use a managed service, why not use a managed service? But as for the question, well, why not run it in a container? Um, the thing is that it helps the upgrade cycle. It helps the maintenance cycle. So it takes steps away. And I think you know, if you're, say, running MySQL and your data is stored on a persistent body, it could be on a Google persistent disk, it could be on a it could be anything else. Your data is stored there, but as you go and you are able to update the container, to ship between versions. You don't have to migrate the whole thing or you don't have to do anything else with it. So it's a different way of doing it. You could run it on a bare metal machine without anything else in there. You know, that's entirely up to you and you need to, I guess, factor in how you want to run these things. But in terms of the platform itself, you can run anything you want in containers and you can manage it as a unit with all of its dependencies contained together with the container being um, on its own migration strategy versus the data that's separate from it. So, right. Yeah. So it will be good to see you know, how it goes into the future and how, how people adopt it. Okay. Um, I'm so sorry that we've gone over the time by about an hour, but the topics were really interesting. Thank you very much, Hunter, for the talk on storage. Mark, thank you very much for the talk on Zavata.